So here we go. We are part of the chapter related to railway planning, the first chapter, and today we'll be talking about the rail history. In order to understand how the railway uh, has emerged as a transport mode, we have to understand the realities around that, emer around that emergence. How did the rail have become a necessity in comparison with horse and cart and water transport? And without further ado, so let's try, let's start to have a look at the rail history. So, and yes, the rail history. So, it has all started back around early 1800s. So at that time, water-based transport was risky and slow. You can see because of the pirates, because of the coast, because of uh, storms. Also, road transport has small volume. And by road transport, we, we mean like the transport that is a cart, car, uh, transport that is dependent on animals like horses and a, car, a cart that's being uh, dragged by horses. So the early history, in order to summarize the reason, the railways have emerged because there was a need to move bulk commodities in large quantities. And the building costs of canals and turnpikes was very high. You can see at one of the pictures, this is a canal. But also because of the inefficiency of horse and cart, it becomes very difficult to change horses or to feed the horses. It becomes very expensive and sometimes not efficient. And the long journey times that the canal or the road the cart was taking have, uh, really have created a need for a faster mode of transport. But also poorer people have to travel to work in a cheap manner. For that reason, you have this locomotive and 1825 and 18 um, uh, kind of 30 steam locomotive and this mode of transport have emerged. And you can see around 1825, there is maybe a zero kilometers of track and you can see the, the area of greatness where, for example, in, in around 1840, 15 years later, 600 miles of tracks were added. This is only in the UK, just to show you, because the, the, the railways have emerged in the UK, and to show you the expansion that happened. And around 1845, more than 1,100 miles of tracks were added only in that year. And after that, around 400 to, uh, to 300 kilometers have been, uh, have been added to the network every year until around 1910, where the network has become almost complete and there was an emergence of a new mode of transport, which is the car. And we'll talk about this more. So this is, you can see the railway map around 1836, a few tertiary lines. And you can see uh, 1911, all the cities and all the major hubs uh, in uh, the UK have been connected. It's not only the UK, but also there was a, a decrease in the growth of railways between them between 1910 and around 2000. So you can see, but after 2000, there was an, uh, a new need to move large people in China, large number of people and large number of goods in China. And you can see that between the year 2000, the, lot, the size of the network in China was around 68,700 kilometers, and it has doubled, more than doubled in 2019 to be more than, 139,000 uh, 139, of, uh, 139, of, uh, of railway tracks. And it's, it's not only uh, suburban railways, but also metros have uh, been expanding in Asia, specifically where there is a large number of people and metros become a very efficient way for moving uh, people within the city it becomes a very, very productive urban transport system. So we can see in only between 2019 to 2020, while I'm doing this presentation around 2020, 
many metros have opened. You see Qatar, Doha metro, you can see China, Windsor metro in India, Ahmedabad metro, and in Australia in, 20, in 2019, uh, Sydney metro, Lahore metro in 2020. So there is also a boom in Asia specifically in terms of metros and uh, the number of metros that is being added within the cities. It's not only metros, but also high speed rail. And you can see this is passenger kilometer billions, the number of people have been transported multiplied by the number of kilometers. Uh, so the, the graph shows that in China, the number of people that have been transported by high speed rail is higher than any time in history and it's growing. And you can see the other, uh, the other lines can be Japan and Germany also increasing, uh, uh, not as much as China, but also growing. So also high speed rail in certain countries are expanding. For example, in a, in a in near the Middle East, one of the countries that have ex, ex, experienced an, uh, a boom in high speed a boom in high speed rail is Turkey, where they have now I don't know the exact number of uh, uh, high speed rail lines, but there are many under construction. And you can go to uh, to my interview with Mr. Usama Ikiji, but you can see the line here between Konya and Ankara, and between Ankara and Istanbul, and there is another high speed rail to is Kishir. So this is the expanded expansion of high speed rail lines in Turkey. And the, the future of uh, railways is not about is not only about high speed and it's not only about uh, uh, metros. There is also new systems that is being developed and those uh, systems can you can see the maglev there is a world speed record at 603 kilometers per hour and i think this was in japan or uh, and there is also a new development on a new system that is called hyperloop which is basically a, a train that is put inside a vacuum where you don't have an air resistance and it's being lifted by uh, by uh, is, is have a kind of a, a active maglev or, uh, or uh, some kind of mag magnetic liftation. And it has been tested in November 2020, and it was tested to reach 172 kilometers per hour inside the test track. This is inside a vacuum inside this test uh, tank. Now, where does the future? So the future, I have my own opinions on the future of railways because there is a very strong competition from other modes of transport like electric cars and autonomous cars. Sometimes I feel in order for railways to compete in the future, they have to offer services beyond, beyond, beyond transport and leverage existing infrastructure. So we have, we have a, one, a large, a great infrastructure and we really need to leverage this. And sometimes you can leverage this infrastructure with trying to offer new services. And one of the things that I can, uh, some of the services that can be offered to your railway is a trust and security services. But I think we are looking for innovators. We really need innovators, people who are smart, who are really keen on developing the next generation of technologies and build it, uh, build the next, the next, uh, wave of services that can be offered for railways in order to be uh, a, a sustainable mode of transport and a competitive mode of transport in the future. That was our rail history section. We'll see you in the next section and have a great evening. So this was the rail history section. See you soon.